Can you hear me? Good morning, Sister Gloria. How are you today? Good morning. If you are watching, I'm going to ask that you say good morning or something. Let me know that you are there this morning. Um, welcome to the Saturday morning breakfast Bible study with Lydia Evelyn Spragan, pastor of the Patton Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, located at 3547 East. 142nd Street in Cleveland, Ohio. 43, um, I'm sorry, 44120. Uh, I'm going to ask that if you're getting any value uh, from these Bible studies that you share them on your Facebook page. We want everybody, somebody, anybody to learn how to study the Bible for themselves so that nobody will have the excuse that I did not understand. Good morning, Ramona. Good morning, Michelle. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come to this time where we have gathered together once again for one hour to simply study your word. We ask, Father God, that you would send your Holy Spirit and that he would teach us, Father God, what we need to know. And that we, Father God, would be led by the Holy Spirit as to how to practically apply all that we learn today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me take a moment here and cut off my phone. Amen. Um, today we're going to study renewal. Renewal. R E N E W A L. Renewal. Good morning, Bell. Renewal is the day by day process by which the Holy Spirit transforms your mind, body, and soul, so that you turn from where you are towards where God would have you to be, which is in conformity with his image, his mind, and his standards, so that you can become a living witness to others, have life, and not just survive, Abundant life and life eternal. Let me repeat that definition again. Renewal. R-E-N-E-W-A-L. Renewal is the day-by-day -day process by which the Holy Spirit transforms your mind, body, and so, so that you turn from where you are towards where God would have you to be, which is in conformity with his image, his mind, and his standards, so that you can become a living witness to others, have life, and not just survive, abundant life, and life eternal. Renewal does not happen overnight. 
nor do you ever complete the process of renewal until there is not any longer any breath within you. Because as long as you are alive, you shall be prone to wander from the pathway of right living and being in right standing with God. Renewal is a function not of what you can do, but what the Holy Spirit living within you does to you. Renewal requires that you become a willing vessel upon the will of the potter. Now, so that this reference isn't lost upon anyone, let's take a quick look at Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, the first through the 10th verses. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, the first through the 10th verses. And I'm reading today from the Modern Life Study Bible, the New King James Version. Jeremiah, which is in the Old Testament, if you can't find it, look it up in the, in the contents. The 18th chapter, beginning at the first verse. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Now, what do I want you to get out of this? Renewal is not something that you do. You are the clay. God is the potter. Now, when I was in college, I had a friend named Betsy, and Betsy was a potter. And so one night, she took me over to the potter's house, the, the place where they were making pots. And she set me at the wheel. And she says, today you're going to make a bowl. So she gave me a lump of clay. I sat it in the middle of the wheel. I thought, this should be fairly easy. And I wet my hands with the water and whatnot. Now, in order to make this bowl, the wheel has to turn round and round. And in order to get the wheel to turn round and round, you've got to move your feet on the bottom wheel so that the wheel turns around and round while you move your hands at the same time to shape the bowl and keep your hands wet enough so that the clay will be molded into the shape you want it. I put more holes in that piece of clay while she sat over there and made beautiful bowls. She knew what she was doing. She knew exactly how much water to put on her hands. She knew when to move her feet. She knew when to move her fingers. She knew what she had in mind as to what she wanted that bowl to look like. 
She knew that if she pushed it too hard, that she might punch a hole in it and destroy it. She knew that if she didn't take her time in the, in the little places and make it thin in some places and thick in others, that the bowl might not stand the pressure, that the bowl might not be fit for use. So she took her time and made the bowl. God is your potter. He has made you. The bowl does not say to the potter, look at here. This is what I want to do. And I'm going to do it. Never does the bowl speak up and say a word. Because the bowl is being shaped as a vessel for use by the potter. God knows the plans and the purposes that he has for you. He knows what's inside of you that would mar the image that he is making of you. Renewal is not something that you do. It's something that God does through the power of the Holy Spirit who is living within you. Now, Isaiah 64 and 8. Let's turn there. Isaiah 64 and 8. It says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. We are all the work of your hand. Romans 9, 20 and 21. Romans 9. It's in the New Testament. The ninth chapter. Verse 20. And it says, and this time I'm going to read it from the, the NIV. But you who, but who are you? Who are you? A human being to talk back to God. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? When we're talking about renewal, it's not something we do to ourselves. It's something that God is doing as we sit on the wheel of life. The wheel is turning. We're on a journey. And as long as the wheel is turning, it's not about us. It's about him. It's about him. Your renewal depends on your willingness to submit to the will of God in your life. If you want to have a life and not just survive, then you must allow God, who is the giver of life, the giver of life, Genesis 2 and 7, says, Genesis, the first book, chapter 2, verse 7, says, Then the Lord, God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. And just like God gave you life, God has the right to take your life. Job 1 and 21. Job 1 and 21 says, Naked came I Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's the NIV rendering. Now, there are two kinds of renewal that I want to talk about today. Actually, three. 
spiritual renewal, physical renewal. And in there, I'm going to talk about rest, R-E-S-T, rest. Now, I want to look at a, a bunch of scriptures first so that we can get an idea of what, what's going on when we talk about renewal. The first scripture I want to look at is Psalm 51 and 10. Psalms 51, verse 10. Reading from the New King James. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What do we want him to do? We want him to renew a steadfast spirit within me. An unmovable spirit. Spirit that's going to hang on no matter what you're going through. How you going through it. When you going through it. Who you going through with. You want him to renew in you a steadfast spirit. Romans 12. That's in the New Testament. Romans 12. Chapter, I mean, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. And it reads, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What are we going to be doing? We're going to be renewing our mind. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. We're still in the New Testament. Going forward. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And here's what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So what are we going to have here? We're going to have a new creation. We're going from an old creation to a new creation. And the thing about it is... That the old creation is not the new creation. There is a transformation that is going on between the old creation and the new creation. Uh, Ephesians 4. Still going forward in the New Testament. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 22nd through the 24th verse. And here it reads, that you put off, let me back up, because that's middle sentence. If indeed, verse 21, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So what are we doing? We are taking off our former life and we are putting on a new self. Putting on a new self. And why are we doing that? Because we, we create it to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we're moving to be like God. That's his image. In true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3. Still going forward. Remember I said G-E-P-C. Those books are together. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So Colossians 
the third chapter and the ninth verse. And it says, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is in all, Christ is all and in all. What are we doing here? We're taking off our old self and our old practices. That means we're going to be renewing ourselves and putting on a new self, which is renewed in knowledge, the image of the creator. We're going to renew our knowledge of the image of the creator. Titus. It's over in the T section. Titus, the third chapter, the fifth through the sixth verse. And here it says, beginning at the fifth verse, not by works. Well, let me let me go back. Start at verse three. But we ourselves were once also were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You can guess what's coming up, right? You're going to be renewed away from those things. But circle but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we're going to be renewed what? By the Holy Spirit. Renewed by the Holy Spirit. Now when the Bible speaks of renewal, it sometimes refers to the physical renewal as well. And that's rest. A lot of us don't get that. I'm guilty. Uh, that is required for our bodies to continue to function at their best. God himself instituted a day of rest for his people every week. And let's look at that. Exodus 34, the second chapter, um, second book in the Bible, Exodus. The 34th chapter. And the 21st verse. Exodus, the 34th chapter, and the 21st verse. And it reads, Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. That's, that's not an option. You shall rest. I feel convicted. <laughs> right this minute, I feel convicted. Six days shall you work. But you shall rest. Hallelujah. And Psalms 23 speaks of a physical rest only God can provide. Now, I want you to look at this word. And uh, it's, it's written in Hebrew. And you read Hebrew from right to left. So the word that you are looking at starts on this side and moves to this side. And the word that you're looking at is Sabbath. Sabbath. We've heard of it. S-A-B-B-A-T-H is how we spell it in the English. Sabbath. And I want you to write this down. This, this, these three letters as best you can. This, this letter, if I can get my fingers right. This letter is Shin. Shin, Kalim, Shin. This letter 
is bet, bet. This letter is tav, T-A-V, shin, S-H-I-N, bet, B-E-T-H, tav, T-A-V, shin, bet, tav, sabbat. Now, this is an important word. And I don't know if you grew up like I did. I just thought, okay, the Sabbath day you shall rest. God said keep it holy and rest. But that's not all this word means. That's not all this word means. Now, uh, I'm taking these notes because I'm not a Hebrew scholar. So I looked at... Uh, the Hebrew scholar page on the web and I did a it has a Hebrew word study on the word Sabbath so I'm taking these notes from there it says the word Sabbath literally means rest or interruption cessation or desist the interesting thing about the word is that using the pictograph, this is a pictograph, using the pictograph addition method, you get an interesting picture. Okay? First of all, the letter Shin, which is right here, this letter, which means teeth, has a point on the upper right-hand corner, a Shalim. Now, this is the point. This is called a point. Okay? It's a, a, a dot to us. Okay? But it's called, it's, it's a shalem. This point means the opposite or the emphasis of the letter is opposite what it stands for. Shit. The second letter, bet. Bet used in Sabbath commandment and in law commandment commentaries in the Bible has an internal point right here, an internal point, okay? The emphasis here is intimate or deeply internal to the letter. Shin, bet, tall, okay? The three letters added together are as follows. Shin, stop chewing, stop processing. Bet, house internal. Tob, covenant. Stop chewing, stop processing. House internal and covenant. The picture is of cessation of work inside the house. However, it has a covenant attached to it. This covenant envelopes or brings further meaning to the cessation of activity. It points toward purpose. Points toward purpose. That is why the bet is internally pointed. So there's a reason why this point is in here, in this house. Uh, you might know the word bet from the word Bethlehem. Bethlehem literally means house of bread. In here it's saying this house, this point is internal to this house. The Sabbath does mean rest, but it is far from being just a cessation of work. It means the cessation of work has a picture to it. It points to a rest spoken of in the law or the covenant. That begs the question, what is the Sabbath rest spoken of in the law? There are some peculiar places that the word rest is used. Let's look at it. In Joshua, and I'm going to lay this down. Hopefully everybody has the picture because I'm going to be coming back to it. In Joshua, the 23rd chapter and the first verse. 23rd chapter and the first verse. It reads, Joshua's in the Old Testament. 
23rd chapter and the first verse. It reads, And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. The word rest is used over and over again to mean the enemy has stopped prevailing, that righteousness has reigned. You ought to shout about that. <laughs> you ought to shout. Rest. The enemy has stopped prevailing and righteousness has reigned. Paul in Hebrews explains how God says, as if they should enter my rest. We're going to look at that, that, that Hebrew scripture a little later. He was talking about the rebellious children of Israel that would not believe God, that he would take care of them, and that he would bring rest to the land if they would but obey and follow his covenant. The Sabbath is a promise. This. This is a promise, Sabbath, a promise of victory for the people of God, victory for righteousness, and most importantly, that Christ's work should triumph in the earth and overcome evil and bring rest to the world. This is a lot for this word, Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. As, as Paul says again in Romans, the 8th chapter, in the 22nd verse. And, and just write that note down. I'm going to keep reading. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The world, the creation of God, is waiting for this rest to come on earth. This rest will come through the faithful obedience of the church of Christ. The church will teach the laws of God, the covenant which will in turn disciple the nations to operating their civilizations correctly. The threefold promise of Christ will take full effect. The comforter must come to teach the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin. The law identifies what sin is. Righteousness. The law identifies where we are deficient and need to get busy building. Judgment. The law shows how to act and implement the civilization in the earth. The threefold picture is a rest or a Sabbath. The wicked are overcome and the righteous prevail. But only if, as the picture shows, we take God's laws into the house, internalize it, point here, inside, internalize it, and bring a cessation of effort, stop chewing, against the magnitude of sin about us, prevalent in institutionalized evil. Sabbath, that word means a lot more than just rest. Exodus 20 and 18, 8. I'm sorry, Exodus, the 20th chapter. Let's go to it. I want to hit a couple points here on Sabbath. Exodus, the 20th chapter. And the 18th verse, 8th verse, I'm sorry. Exodus, the 20th chapter, beginning at the 8th verse, says, Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day, the seventh day, is the Sabbath of the Lord. Not it, notice not your day, it's a the Lord's day. The Sabbath of the Lord, your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your maidservant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, 
the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. <coughs> the word hallowed made it holy, sanctified, set it apart. Mark 2 and 27. That's in the New Testament. Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark, the second chapter. And go down to the 21st verse, I mean the 27th verse. Mark, the second chapter, the 27th verse. And it says, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah, that's in the, in the Old Testament, chapter 58, beginning at verse 13. And it says, If you turn your foot, turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasures, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Hmm. That's a, a, a beautiful blessing. We, keeping the Sabbath, doesn't mean necessarily we don't do no, no work. It says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, not only not doing work, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, your pleasure, what you like to do. I ought to leave that alone because, you know, some of us like to do things on the Sabbath that's not really giving praise and honor to God. But that's his day. You ought to do his things, things that bring glory to his name on his day. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to let y'all think about that. Y'all know what y'all doing on the Sabbath day that y'all ought not be doing. I don't have to tell you about it. Hebrews, New Testament, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And we're going to read down to verse 16. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place, of the seventh day, seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. So therefore it remains that some must enter it. 
and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. You cannot enter into the Sabbath rest if you disobedient, not obeying God, God's laws, God's commandments. Don't forget that by its very definition, the word Sabbath has the word covenant, law at the end, covenant. Since therefore, going back to verse 6, it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterwards have spoken of another day. There, there, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. That's a blessing. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Least anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. But we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Ain't it wonderful to put that passage of scripture in the context of this word, Sabbath, rest, stop, chewing it's internal to your house and the and the and the law the covenant that God has made with you that's why when we as believers actually allow God to work with us on the potter's wheel we enter into his rest his rest and we began to be transformed renewed in our mind in our bodies and in our souls let's look at Matthew chapter 5 Matthew one of the first gospels in the New Testament Matthew chapter 5, begin at verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, begin at verse 17. And it says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, 
one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the word that I want to pay attention to right there is jot or tittle. Jot or tittle. And again, I'm, I'm looking, I, I did my research. I'm looking at uh, www.phrases.org UK slash meaning slash jot or tittle dot HTML. What is the meaning of the word jot or tittle? Again, look at this word. A tiny amount. What is the origin of the phrase jot or tittle? The phrase jot or tittle is somewhat tautological. T-A-U-T-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. As both jot and tittle refer to tiny quantities. It has passed into the English via William Tyndale's translation of the New Testament in 1526. And it appears there in Matthew 5, 18. One jot or one title of the law shall not escape. The more familiar of King James Version 16, 11 says, For barely I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. A jot is the name of the least letter of an alphabet or the smallest piece of writing in the Englishized version of Greek, iota, the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet, which corresponds to the Roman I. This in turn was derived from the Hebrew word yo which is the smallest letter of the square Hebrew alphabet. If you think of yo it kind of like as an apostrophe. The comma that goes at the top. It's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Apart from its specialized typographical meaning, we still use the word jot more generally to mean a tiny amount. Hence, when we have a brief note to make, we jot it down. A tittle, rather appropriately for the word, which sounds like a combination of tiny and little is smaller still. It refers to a small stroke or point in the writing or printing. Sometimes they, they, you would say these, these dots might be tittles. In classical Latin, this is applied to any accent over a letter, but it is now most commonly used as a name for the dot over the I. It is also the name of the dots on dice. In medieval calligraphy, the title was written as quite large relative to the stem of the I. Since fixed typeface printing was introduced in the 15th century, the title has been rendered smaller. The use of the word dot as a small written mark didn't begin until the 18th century. We may have been told at school to dot our eyes. Chaucer and Shakespeare would have been told to tittle them. Listen, what I'm trying to say is renewal, rest. God mean what he say. No jot, no tittle shall, shall, shall go away. We must enter into his rest. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We can't do away with it. It's not going to pass away from us. We must enter into his rest. 
We, do, we enter into his rest when we allow the Holy Spirit to do his work inside of us without fighting, without disagreeing, without arguing, without, well, I got to have it my way. This ain't Burger King. This is not Burger King. You cannot have it your way. You must have it his way. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts and his ways are higher than ours. He alone knows the plans that he has for us. We don't have a clue what tomorrow will bring. We can be caught off guard at any minute. But not God. He's always ready. Nothing ever catches him off guard. And so therefore, when we are entering into his rest, we have that peace, that passive all understanding. We can truly not be anxious and don't worry. Because it's not about us. It's about him. And he's promised that all of his plans will not harm us. So why worry? Entering into his rest. When we enter into his rest, we have a renewal of our mind. Galatians 5 and 22 through 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. When we enter into his rest, Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Just write it down. Colossians, the third chapter. The 12th through the 14th verse, and I'm reading from the ESV. Put on then as God chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love. Listen, the key thing here, you put it on. Put it on like you do your, your shirt, your coat, your jacket, your underwear. Every day, put it on. Just like you put it on, you can take it off. But you need to put it on. Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. When you enter into his rest, you can pray like David in Psalms 51, verses 10 through 12. Write it down. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. You can say, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. When you have a renewed mind, Romans 12, 1 through 2 comes into play. Romans 12, I'm reading now from the New Living Translation. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. By changing the way you think, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It, 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 this renewal, this, this strength that you get, 
It's not from you. God knows that there are a lot of things in life that could break you down. But Isaiah 40 and 31 says, But they, hallelujah, who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings, hallelujah, like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Uh, listen. When you have a renewal going on in your life. Psalms 119 and uh, verse 114 comes into play. I'm reading from the Message Bible now. It says, you are my quiet, my place. You are my place of quiet retreat. I wait for your word to renew me. God's word will renew you. Psalms 119, that same verse, 114 in the New Living Translation says, You are my refuge and my shield. Your word is my source of hope. I have a little more to say, but I don't have time to say it. So I'll pick up here next week with a little bit more about renewal. Let us pray. Gracious God, I'm tired of doing things my own way. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. I don't know when to do it. Help me, Father God, to be the clay on the potter's wheel. Help me, Father God, to sit in place like the clay, no matter what happens. Knowing that you got my best interest at heart. And no matter what I'm going through, be it the storm, be it the fire, be it the midnight hour, no matter what I'm going through, you have never promised, never, you have promised never to leave me nor forsake me. And, and because I'm the clay, on the wheel. Your hands, hallelujah, your hands are always on me. Shaping me, molding me, making sure that I'm the vessel that you would have me to be. Hallelujah. Help me, Father God, to enter into your rest. I don't want to be disobedient to you any longer. I want to obey your will. Here I am. All that I am, all that I ever hope to be, is yours. I surrender all. Make me and mold me into the vessel that you would have me to be. Used set aside for your purpose. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And praise God. We thank y'all so much for joining us this morning for the Bible study. We pray and hope that you have gotten a word. And we look forward to seeing you again on next Saturday at 10 a.m. Here in the same place. God bless you. God keep you. Until we meet again, be safe.